The focus of this video will be understanding variability and its relationship to the normal distribution curve. Let's briefly review the mean before moving on to a discussion of variability. The mean is used to summarize quantitative data. It's one of the averages that's typically used. Averages are also known as measures of central tendency. The mean summarizes by telling us where scores tended to fall. The formula for a sample mean is sigma x over n, which means summation of raw scores divided by sample size. So the mean is an average of raw scores. It's something that tells us where quantitative scores tended to be. With that, we often discuss something called variability. To vary means to differ, so measures of variability indicate how different raw scores were from each other. So the mean says here's where scores tended to be, and variability says here's how far apart scores tended to be. Just as there are different kinds of averages like the mean, median, and mode, there are different kinds of variability. But in general, when we talk about a variable's variability, we're talking about how different scores were. Keep in mind, if you've learned about this before, that a constant is something that is measured that doesn't vary, and that variables are key to statistics because they are things that we measure that are, do vary. That is, they are things that differ or are expected to differ. Scores must vary in order for us to do most of the calculations that are used in statistics. The first measure of variability for us to review is the exclusive range. This is often just referred to as the range. It's similar to how when folks say average, they often are referring to the mean, even though the word average is general. When people say range, they're often talking about the exclusive range, even though there are other kinds of range that can be computed. The exclusive range tells us to put the data in order from highest score down to lowest score, and then find the difference between the highest score and the lowest score by subtracting. In this data set for age, the highest age value is 47, and the youngest or lowest age value is 14. So to find the exclusive range, we would take 47 and subtract 14. And when we do so, we find that the exclusive range is 33. Let's try this with another data set. Let's say we have a variable called x, where the raw scores are 7, 8, 6, 4, and 5. To find the exclusive range, we need to identify the highest score in the data set. The uh, highest number is an 8, and then the lowest number, 4. Note here that when I'm talking about highest and lowest, I'm not talking about highest and lowest as they're already written. We're talking about highest and lowest in value or meaning. So the highest value number is 8, we subtract from that the lowest value number, which is 4, and we get here that the exclusive range for variable x is 4. Now let's review the second measure of variability called the inclusive range. This one is more rarely used. When we find the inclusive range, it's similar to the exclusive range in that we find highest score and then subtract from that the lowest score, but we have an extra step where we add 1. Let's find the exclusive range using the age data. The highest score is 47, the lowest score is 14, and to that we must add 1. Order of operations dictates that we do adding and subtracting from left to right, so our first step is to take 47 minus 14, which gives us 33. Then our second step is to add the 1, which gives us an inclusive range of 34. Now let's talk about why one gets added back in. The exclusive range focuses on the distance between two scores, whereas the inclusive range focuses on how many numbers are in the span, including the lowest number. I'm going to demonstrate this principle of inclusion with a smaller and simpler data set. To find the inclusive range for this smaller data set, we'll call it x, I'm going to find the highest, and again the lowest, and I'm going to plug those into the formula. Highest is 8, minus lowest, which is 4, then I'm going to add 1, 
Order of operations dictates adding and subtracting from left to right. So I have 8 minus 4, which is 4. Then I'm going to add the 1, and this gives me 5. So the inclusive range for this data set is 5. So why do we add 1? Well, the reason for this is because it tells us about the position of the numbers along the number line and how many numbers were included. I'm going to give us a number line here, just part of it. And I'm going to have my number line go from 3 to 4 to 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. So I can fit all of my data points here. Okay. Then I'm going to translate the numbers that we have in the raw data onto my number line. I have 1, 7. I have 1, 8. I have 1, 6, 1, 4, and 1, 5. The inclusive range is asking how many numbers there are from and including the lowest number in the data set up to and including the highest number in the data set. So what we're interested in is what the span is including the lowest to the highest. So all of the numbers that exist from the lowest to the highest as whole digits or integers are 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. That gives us our inclusive range. In contrast, the exclusive range is not interested in the endpoints, including the endpoints and then everything in the middle. Instead, the exclusive range is interested in the uh, distance traveled to get from the lowest score to the highest. So if we start at the 4 and we go up 1, 2, 3, 4 spaces, we get to the highest number. So the exclusive range is interested in the movements from the lowest up to the highest, where the inclusive range is interested in all of the numbers, including the lowest to the highest in the span of digits. Let's take a look at the exclusive and inclusive range one more time with a new set of data for x. Again, I'm going to draw that number line to demonstrate how the inclusive and exclusive ranges work and how they differ. I'm going to put a dot for each of the raw scores. I have a raw score of 2, a raw score of 5, a raw score of 6, and two raw scores of 9. Let's start with the inclusive range. We want to include every number here from the lowest to the highest. So we want to know the range including the endpoints. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 different numbers. So the inclusive range here is 8. Now let's do our exclusive range, which is interested in the movement from the lowest score to the highest score. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So the exclusive range is always one unit lower than the inclusive range. The reason for that is when we take highest minus lowest, we are, by definition of this formula, removing or excluding the lowest score. So when I do 9 minus 2, I'm getting rid of the 2. That causes the exclusive range to always be one unit lower than the inclusive range. Did you notice that all of the variables I've given you so far are presumed to be quantitative? That's because the inclusive range and the exclusive range are only useful for quantitative data. The same will be true for all of the measures of variability discussed in this video. Another form of variability that is used is the deviation, and from that, something called the standard deviation. Deviation just means difference from the mean. So a deviation in statistics refers to how much a raw score differs from its sample mean. The formula for this is that deviation equals raw score minus the mean score. In this formula, x refers to the individual raw score and x bar or m refers to the mean. We'll start here by reviewing how to find deviations. Presume that I have variable scores, or raw scores, of 10, 9, 8, 7, and 6. Well, to find the deviation, I first need to find the mean, because that's required in the formula. So I'm going to get the mean for these raw scores. That's the sum of x divided by the sample size. That's 10 plus 9 plus 8 plus 7 plus 6 
divided by the sample size, which is 5. This gives us 40 divided by 5, which is 8. So the mean for this is 8. Now we can use the deviation formula to find the deviation of each raw score. To find that, we take each raw score and subtract the mean. So for this, I'm going to do 10 minus 8, then 9 minus 8, then 8 minus 8, then 7 minus 8, and finally 6 minus 8. These will give me the deviations for each of the raw scores. So my deviation for the first score was positive 2, for the second score, positive 1, for the third score, 0, for the fourth score, negative 1, and for the last score, negative 2. So notice here that I have some positive deviations and some negative deviations. You can have positive and negative deviations. In fact, if you find the deviations for every raw score in a data set, you will always have at least one which is positive and at least one which is negative. The standard deviation uses deviation but puts it in, as the name implies, a standard format. It's a summary of how far members of the sample tended to deviate from the mean. Essentially, the standard deviation is a summary of all the deviations for the raw scores, the same way that the mean is a summary for all the raw scores. So means summarize raw scores, standard deviation summarizes deviations. Because the standard deviation tells us how far scores tended to be from one another, a small standard deviation means scores tended to be close to each other and therefore also close to the mean. When the standard deviation is large, it means scores were further from each other and therefore also further from the mean. So standard deviation tells us how far apart scores tended to be from one another and the mean. So when the standard deviation is small, it means scores were relatively similar or close to one another. And when the standard deviation is large, it means that scores were relatively dissimilar or far from each other on the number line. Notice again here that we're talking only about quantitative data. You cannot find a standard deviation or even a deviation for qualitative data. Let's assume I have two samples of data and each sample has the same mean. You could have two samples of data where the raw scores are not the same numbers as one another, but you could still get the same mean score. The standard deviation adds a little bit of information for us about what the raw scores looked like. So here in the purple example, I have a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 2. This has a smaller standard deviation than my red data. And I'm not showing you the raw data here, I'm just giving you the summary of the mean and standard deviation. But even without looking at the raw data, I know that because the standard deviation is smaller for these purple data, that these data are pretty similar to each other, and that the raw scores were generally pretty close to being exactly 100. In contrast, in the red group, the standard deviation is quite large, so this means that the raw scores are pretty spread out around 100. They're far away from one another and the mean score of 100 relative to what we would see here for the purple data. The mean alone tells us where scores tended to be, and the standard deviation gives us another layer of information, which tells us how far scores tended to be from one another or the mean. When the standard deviation is small, Scores are close to each other and the mean. When standard deviations are large, scores are far from each other and the mean. Let's explore this concept by looking at some data. Pretend that we have data from four classes of students. We'll call these classes A, B, C, and D. Assume that all four classes took the exact same 100 point exam, and that what you're seeing are the mean scores and standard deviations for each of those groups. Which of the classes, A, B, C, or D, had the highest or most desirable score on the exam on average? You should be guessing that it's group C, because they had the highest mean at a score of 90. Which group had the lowest score on average? You should be getting group D, because they had a mean score of 70. Which two groups had the same average score. You should be selecting groups A and B 
because each of those had students with a mean score of 80. Now let's turn to the standard deviations. Which group had the highest or largest standard deviation? That's going to be group A because they had a standard deviation of 20. Which group had the lowest standard deviation on average? You should be picking group D because they had a standard deviation of 5. And then you'll see here if we look at groups B and C, they had equally large standard deviations with a standard deviation of 10. Let me reword and ask again. Which of these four groups had students who varied the most in their scores? You should be getting group A because the larger the standard deviation, the more the scores varied. We would also then identify that group D had students who varied the least, and there was similar variability in groups B and C because they each had a standard deviation of 10. Let's talk about what it means to have normally distributed data. When we say that data are normal or that they are normally distributed, we're saying the same thing, which is that scores tended to be within one standard deviation of the mean. More specifically, when data are normally distributed, we expect about two thirds of the raw scores to be from one standard deviation below the mean to one standard deviation above the mean. When I say approximately two thirds here, I'm talking about 68.26%. I'm not gonna get into why that's the percent in this video, but you will see it in another video later. So when our data are normally distributed, we expect the majority of scores, two thirds, to be from one standard deviation below the mean to one standard deviation above the mean. Let's take a look at this and apply the concept to group A. They have a mean score of 80, and we expect about two thirds of scores to be from one standard deviation below the mean to one standard deviation above the mean. So that means we expect most scores to be somewhere between 60 and 100 for group A. We use the exact same concept for group B. They also had a mean score of 80, but they had a smaller standard deviation. So we're expecting uh, scores to be somewhere between 80 minus 10, which is 70, and 80 plus 10, which is 90. Take a look at groups A and B side by side here. We see that the range of scores within which we expect two thirds of scores to fall for group A is 60 to 100 and that corresponding range in group B is 70 to 90. So we're expecting the raw scores to be more spread out in group A than in group B because there's a wider span around the mean because there's a larger standard deviation uh, in, within which we expect two thirds of scores to fall. I can repeat the same process for groups C and D and get the range where I expect the scores to fall in those two groups. In group C, I expect about two thirds or 68.26% of folks to have a score between 80 and 100. And in group D, I expect about two thirds or about 68.26% of folks to be between scores of 65 and 75. Notice here that in group D, where we had the smallest standard deviation, we also had the narrowest span within which we expect two thirds of scores. Where in group A, where we had the largest standard deviation, we ended up with the largest span where we expected scores to be. So pause here and think about this. If you could join one of these four classes based on their performance, which class would you like to join? Pause, look at this, and then decide. Would you prefer to be in class A, B, C, or D? Presuming that the performance you're seeing in these classes would be mirrored in your own performance. If I got to choose, I would choose joining class C. This is because most folks were expected to have scores between 80 and 100. That's B's and A's. Now pause to think about which of these four classes you would least like to join using the same concepts. I'd be least interested in joining sample D. The reason I chose sample D is because most folks got a D or a C in this class. Now sample A also had a similar spread with low scores like that score of 60. 
but it also had that possibility of high scores, like 100. So I'm hopeful that I'm gonna be in that 100 group, or maybe a 90 or an 80 in group A, but it's not looking like those scores of 80, 90, or 100, or 100 are particularly likely in group D, because most scores were not that high. Now I'll ask this another way. Let's assume that classes C and D are full, so you have to choose between class A or class B. Which one would you prefer to join between classes A and B? If you're hoping you can get 100, you're probably better off choosing class A because there is that chance uh, of getting 100 within that two-thirds group in the class we're seeing scores of 100. But you're also rolling the dice a little bit here because there's a better possibility of a low score like 60 in group A versus group B because the low end of our expected range in group B was a 70. So some folks prefer B because it decreases the risk of getting a D in the class or a score of 60. But it also comes with a decrease in the risk of getting a high A because we expected folks here to be between 70 and 90. So a choice between A and B here is a little bit more difficult and has more to do with whether you think you would be in the higher performing or possibly in that lower performing group. But when we weren't pitting these two against each other, it was pretty easy to see that we would prefer to be in the classes with higher scores possible, and we want to avoid the ones where in general folks were in a low score range. So what I want you to notice here is that just looking at the means gives us less information to go on than if we have the standard deviations with them. That can help us make a decision that fits for ourselves or for whatever the case may be that we're trying to deal with with our data. Remember that in statistics, we use data to understand what's going on in the world, and then we use that understanding to help us make informed decisions. Now it's your turn to try. Look at the means and SDs for sample E and F. Pause and find the span of scores or the range of scores within which we would expect to find about 68.26% of folks in sample E and about 68.26% of folks in sample F. That is, find the range around the mean where we expect about two-thirds of folks to fall. For group E, you should be getting that about two-thirds of folks would have scores between 75 and 81. And for group F, you should get that about two-thirds of folks would be between scores of 57 and 99. Now take a moment to think for yourself about which of these two classes you would prefer to join, presuming that you would perform similarly to the class based on these data. If you're a little bit of a gambler, you might choose group F because there's that possibility of the really high score 99, but you're also accepting the risk that you'd be in the lower score range around 57. If you're more conservative, you might stick with group E because there's a really tight range around the mean where you're expected to be, somewhere between about a 75 and an 81, so a C to a low B. That's because group E has a small standard deviation relative to the standard deviation of sample F. Now note here that the means are equivalent. So the standard deviation together with the mean gives us more information to help us understand the data set. If we were looking at the raw data for sample E, we would see scores that were really close together, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, 80, 81. Most would be in that range. But in sample F, we're gonna see a whole bunch of different numbers, somewhere between 57 to 99 for the majority of those numbers. Now note here that I've said that about two thirds of scores would be inside the indicated ranges. That means that approximately one third of scores are expected to be below the low end and above the high end of each of these spans. Let's try one more. Pause here and find that range around each of these means where we would expect to find about two thirds or 68.26% of scores. Let's take a look at the answers. If we're looking for the span of scores around the mean where about two thirds of scores are expected to fall for group one, we'll actually see that that is from 40 to 40. That's because this is a constant. Whatever is going on in group one, the variable that we were attempting to measure actually turned out to be a constant. We know that because the standard deviation was zero, 
When the standard deviation is zero, it means there's no difference in scores. They're all exactly the same. And if they're all exactly the same, they must be right at that mean of 40. So to find the span around the mean, we took 40 plus zero and 40 minus zero, which gave us a range of 40 and 40, indicating that this is a constant. Now notice here that I'm using capital S, capital D to stand for standard deviation. That's the way we write up standard deviation in paragraphs or in papers when we report statistics. We use S to stand for standard deviation in formulas. We use SD, usually when we're writing sentences in a report. So I'm introducing you to that new symbol here, SD. For group two, we would expect about two thirds of scores to be between 35 and 45. For group three, we expect about two thirds of scores to be between 20 and 60. For group four, we expect about two thirds of scores to be between 19 and 21. And for group five, we expect about two thirds of scores to be between 15 and 25. So the one that shows the least variability is group one because that is a constant. The one that shows the most variability is group three because it had that large standard deviation. And then look at that range where we expected scores to be. It's quite large relative to the ranges we saw in groups one, two, four, and five. Of all the ones that did vary, so that means excluding group one, the one that varied the least was group four. Now we get to move on to actually seeing the formula that's used to find the standard deviation. The parts of our formula will include deviation, which is raw score minus the mean. We'll see sigma, which means sum or add. And n stands for our sample size. Now let's take a look at the formula. To find standard deviation for a sample, we need to do multiple steps in a specific order. First, we need to find the deviation. That means subtract the mean from each raw score. Because the sum of deviations will always be zero, we want to get rid of the negatives. So once we find each deviation, we will then square each deviation. Once they have been squared, we will sum them or add them up. So, so far our formula says find each deviation, square each deviation, then add those squared deviations. Once we've done that, we divide by n minus one, that's sample size minus one, and our last step is to undo the squaring, so we square root at the end. So these are the steps to using this formula. Find the mean and subtract it from each score to get the deviation. Square each deviation, then add those up. Divide by sample size minus one, and then square root. Though this can seem complicated the first time we look at a formula like this, if we actually step back and look at the steps, each individual step itself is quite easy. It's only asking us to do things like subtract, add, square, square root, and divide. There's nothing more complicated than that. The key to understanding how to properly use a stats formula is simply keeping the order of operations in mind. If we look at the formula and correctly identify which step happens first, then second, third, fourth, and fifth, we will be able to do this math, actually quite simply with a little bit of practice. So let's try it out. Assume we have a data set with a sample size of three with raw scores of three, four, and five. If we find the mean, we simply add up three plus four plus five and divide by three. That gives me 12 divided by three, which gives me four. So I know that the sample size is three and the mean is four. Now I'm ready to plug this into my formula. Let's start with step one, find each deviation. To do that, I'm gonna subtract the mean from each raw score. So it's gonna be three minus four, which gives me negative one, four minus four, which gives me zero, and five minus four, which gives me a positive one. Step two, square each deviation. I'm gonna square negative one, zero, and one. Negative one squared is one, zero squared is zero, and one squared is one. Step three says to sum or add up the squared deviations. So I'm just gonna add the one plus the zero plus the one, which gives me two. Now divide that number by n minus one. I have two over 
n is 3, so 2 over 3 minus 1. That's 2 divided by 2, which is the same as 1. Now we're on the last step, square root. I want the square root of 1, which is 1. So for this data set, with uh, scores of 3, 4, and 5, we have a standard deviation equal to 1. Let's put this together with a concept from earlier, which is that we expect at least two-thirds of scores, or about two-thirds of scores, to be within one standard deviation of the mean. Our mean was 4, and our standard deviation is 1, so we expect most scores to be at the mean minus 1 to at the mean plus 1. So we expect scores to be at 3 to about 5. If I look at the raw scores, they were 3, 4, and 5, thus within the range of between 3 and 5. So we didn't just see that two-thirds of scores were in the range this time, we saw all the scores were within the range this time. That's particularly likely to happen if you have a really small data set. Here we only have three pieces of data. That's the least amount of pieces of raw data you can have and use the standard deviation formula. Now we're going to try it again with some new raw scores. Make sure you have the formula written down on scratch paper. It's standard deviation equals the square root of the sum of x minus x bar which has been squared divided by n minus 1. The first thing you need to do is find the mean and sample size. Pause and find those. You should get that the mean is 10.5 or 10.50 and that the sample size is 6. The next thing you need to do is find the deviations. That's each raw score minus the mean. Pause here and hit play when you found the deviations. We subtract the mean from each raw score and the deviations are 1.5, 0.5, 9.5, one point five, negative zero point five, and negative one point five. Let's pause here to remind ourselves about a key component of the mean. The sum of deviations from the mean is always equal to zero. So the sum of the raw minus the means always must equal zero. So let's check that out. The positive numbers I have are one point five. 0.5 and another 1.5, so the total is 3.5 positives, and then I've got negative 1.5, another negative 1.5, and a negative 0.5, so that's 3.5 minus 3.5, yes, the sum is coming out to zero, everything looks good here. So now we're ready to get back to calculating the standard deviation. We completed our first step by finding the deviations. Now we need to square each deviation so we can get the deviations which have been squared. So we're going to square each of these numbers. Now notice here that for the negative numbers I'm putting brackets. That's so that our calculator will know that I'm squaring a negative 1.5 rather than getting 1.5 squared and then subtracting. We want to put that in brackets or in parentheses to help us with the order of operations. Go ahead and find the squared deviations. Then hit play. My squared deviations are 2.25, 0 0.25, 2.25, 2.25, 0 0.25, and 2.25. Notice an interesting thing that happens here with our numbers that are less than 1 in absolute value. When you square a number that's less than 1 in absolute value, it actually shrinks. The squared result is smaller versus when you square a number who's larger than 1 in absolute value, it gets larger. So if you saw that when you put 0.5 squared in the calculator, it got smaller and you were confused by that because you're used to squaring making things larger, keep in mind that when you do exponents with numbers that are less than 1 in absolute value, the exponent actually causes the number to get smaller. Now back on to our steps. We found the deviations, we now found the squared deviations, and we need to add them up to get the sum of squared deviations. When I add these all together, I get 9.50. 9.50. So now we're ready to put that into our formula. All of these steps together give us the top part of the formula, which is the sum of raw minus the mean, which has been squared. 
that number gave us 9.50. Now let's look at the rest of our formula. We need it then to divide by n minus 1 and then square root. So I'm going to need to divide by n minus 1. Our sample size was 6. I'm going to put 6 minus 1 down here. And then we're going to need to square root. So now I have standard deviation equals the root of 9.50 divided by 5. This gives me s is equal to the square root of 1.90, because 9.5 divided by 5 gave me 1.90. Now I just need to square root that, and when I do so, I get my final answer is 1.378405 approximately. We're going to round to the hundredths place. So when I round my final answer to the hundredths place, or to two decimal places, I get 1.38. So our standard deviation here is 1.38. Pause here for a moment if you want to review the steps. I'm going to be clearing out the gold section of the board so we can look at the area around the mean where we expect scores to be. In this example, we would expect about two-thirds of the raw scores to be between 9.12 and 11.88. This is because we had a mean of 10.5, to which we added approximately the 1.38, and we also subtracted approximately the 1.38. That gave us the range where we expected to see about two-thirds of scores. When we subtracted 1.38, we got 9.12, and when we added it, we got 11.88. When we have a large enough data set, we do expect about two-thirds of the scores to be in the approximate range. Here we have a small data set, so we might expect not exactly two-thirds of them to be exactly in this range, but about two-thirds to be in approximately this range. If I look at the raw scores, 11 and 10 are both in this range. 9 is pretty close to the range, so those two are uh, similar to what was expected, and the 12s are pretty close to the range. So all of our scores are in or close to that range. We're going to do another pause and try it, but before we do, I want to point out something really fun about this formula. It's that there's actually another formula inside of it. This section on the top, which says sum of raw minus the mean, which has been squared, is indeed its own formula. This is known as the SS formula, which stands for sum of squares, or that's the shorthand, or sum of squared deviations from the mean. In fact, the long version of its name is actually all the steps written out, sum of squared deviations from the mean. Because this part of the formula called SS tells us to find each deviation, then square, then add. So this segment here, sum of x minus x bar which has been squared, is indeed its own formula called SS, or sum of squares. Pause now and find the standard deviation for the first, second, and third data set above. If you use the formula, you should get that the standard deviation for the first group, if rounded to the hundredths place, is 3.74. For the second group, that it's 12.56. And for the last group, that it's 19.94. Now take a look at how these standard deviations correspond to the raw scores. We see that the first data set had scores that were really similar to one another. another. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 are much more similar than the scores we're seeing in the other two data sets. Okay, in the first data set, our range from 2 to 10 is quite small, only about 10 digits, 10 units. But in the second group, our lowest score is a 60 and our high is a 92. So there's a 32 unit spread within which we're seeing those raw scores. And in the last one, it's even bigger. The range is going from 48 all the way up to 100. So we have an exclusive range of about 52 here. Don't forget that the ranges are another measure of variability. So what we're seeing here is that when we look at the range, the exclusive range as a measure of variability, it also indicates that the first group would be the smallest in variability, and the last group would be the largest in variability. And we see that mirrored in the small standard deviation for the first group relative to the large standard deviation of the third group, and that second group has a large standard deviation, but is somewhere in between what we're seeing with the other two groups. After carefully reviewing this video and following along, you should be able to find the inclusive range and the exclusive range. You should be able to find the mean and the standard deviation using their respective formulas. 
and you should be able to compare data sets using the mean and standard deviation. That means you should understand how the mean and standard deviation together help us get a better sense of what the raw data are like and why the mean and the standard deviation are typically together. Overall, these three goals together should help you understand why variability is computed, how it can be computed, we learned three ways today, inclusive range, exclusive range, and the standard deviation. And you should have a beginning appreciation and understanding of why it is we don't just look at averages such as the mean, median, and mode, but we often also review our data and summarize them using some measure of variability.